1994's Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, directed by Kensho Yamashita. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 wouldn't break Godzilla vs. Mothra's box office record of $20 million, but it would hit the $18 million mark. As I mentioned in the previous video, in 1994, TriStar was still trying to get the American Godzilla movie up and running. Toho noticed these delays, and so towards the end of Mechagodzilla 2's production, they knew there would be another Godzilla film to make. This next movie would be the 40th anniversary of Godzilla films. Like always, there was a few early ideas considered before it was decided that Space Godzilla would be the new adversary. One of the first proposed ideas was Godzilla vs. Emperor Ghidorah. This draft mostly is a continuation of Tomoyuki Tanaka's story idea from a few years back. Mainly, that Emperor Ghidorah would be more like the Showa-era version of King Ghidorah and have an outer space origin. Additionally, Emperor Ghidorah's gravity beams would live up to the name by having Godzilla float off the ground when hit by them. Shogo Tomiyama would reject this draft, however, as Ghidorah was too similar to the main monster in another movie Toho was making at the time called Orochi the Eight-Headed Dragon. A different explanation is offered in John LeMay's book. Apparently the idea was to have Emperor Ghidorah be a descendant of the Orochi for that upcoming movie. Tomiyama would state that this wouldn't do, however. They needed to think of new monsters because the popular ones were already used. So the next idea they had was Godzilla vs. Astro Godzilla. Astro Godzilla would be created by Violante's cells being sent into space. The monster would invade Earth with an army of giant dragonflies and Godzilla would team up with Mothra and Mogura to stop it. Mickey and Little Godzilla would at one point be turned against Godzilla by Astro Godzilla's psychic powers. During this time, the idea of Godzilla vs. Neo-Godzilla came about as well, with the concept of living crystals being used by the monster. Astro Godzilla had a very elaborate design, and instead of an atomic ray, it would shoot an ice beam of sorts. A lot of this would make it into the final draft, now called Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. But some things, like the giant dragonflies, would be cut, and Mothra's role would be reduced to a cameo. Toho became a little more budget conscious due to Orochi the Eight-Headed Dragon having a disappointing box office. That damn Orochi movie not only made it so Ghidorah wouldn't appear again, but it also caused some of the better ideas to be cut out of the final product. <laughs> what an asshole. But out of all the wild ideas, the wildest would come from Shogo Tomiyama himself. He would write Godzilla Super Wars. And without getting into too much detail, it would have Space Godzilla be an entity similar to Showa era Ghidorah, known for destroying planets, or at least the civilizations living on them. The G-Force would ultimately be revealed to have evil intent. They would plan to use Mickey's psychic powers to control Godzilla for their own purposes. I'd say the best thing in this treatment would be Mechagodzilla 2 reappearing and helping Godzilla in the final fight with Space Godzilla. One of the characters would pilot the Mecha and have a space battle with Space Godzilla before ultimately grabbing onto the monster and self-destructing, ending both entities at once. As you can imagine, this would be too much for Toho's budget, so it didn't make it through. Kensho Yamashita would be tapped as director for Godzilla's 40th birthday. Now why on earth would they switch directors when Takao Okawara was doing such a great job? I can't find a direct answer to that, but I think it's because Okawara was preoccupied directing the Orochi movie. Though Orochi came out in July and Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla would come out in December. I do know that Yamashita was picked to direct by Yoshinobu Hiyashi, the president of Toho himself. Yamashita's background includes being an assistant director on Terra of Mechagodzilla and the return of Godzilla. But for this installment of Godzilla, his background in directing teen idol movies shows. Yamashita brought on screenwriter Hiroshi Kashiwabara. Kashiwabara is mostly known as a contributing writer for animated detective shows like Conan and Lupin III. Kashiwabara would create a story that was much lighter in tone to the previous Heisei era installments. To promote Godzilla's brand further, Toho had a 3D amusement park ride at Sanrio Puroland opened called Monster Planet Godzilla. Megumi Otika would play a hostess on a spaceship that crashes on a planet where the famous Toho monsters live. <laughs> For the previous movie, the Rado Goji suit was used and introduced that heavier appearance that makes Godzilla look sort of obese. 
The Rado Goji suit would only be used for water scenes in this movie. You could actually see the suit falling apart in the water scenes as they didn't anticipate the water deteriorating it so quickly. The suit falling apart and the use of stock footage from previous Heisei era films reeks of a bad habit from the late Showa era. The main suit used for this movie was dubbed Moge Goji. The face is basically the same as Bado Goji and Rado Goji. What makes this suit special is the mechanical device to move the head in different directions instead of just up and down. This was also the first suit to employ a ventilation system to make sure Kenpachiro Satsuma wasn't suffering too much inside the notoriously hot suit. Baby Godzilla has now grown into Little Godzilla. So, what the hell happened here? Special effects director Kochi Kawakita happened. He didn't like the dinosaur-like appearance of Baby Godzilla, so he redesigned him to look like a cute plush toy. According to Kawakita, he wanted to show the transformation from dinosaur to monster. He even tried to convince Tomiyama to approve a separate project called Little Godzilla's Underground Adventure, a television special for children. Though the idea that this was seriously being considered was later denied by Takao Okawara. Little Godzilla's concept art would be created by Shinji Nishikawa. The suit itself would be designed by Shinichi Wakaza and the crew at Monsters, Inc. The Little Godzilla suit was worn by pro wrestler Masanobu Little Frankie Akamoto. This is similar to when Toho got actor Masao Little Man Machan Fukuzawa to play Manila. Besides being cute, a nice scene at the end of the movie shows the little monster attempting to shoot atomic breath. I don't know how to explain it, but when I see stills of little Godzilla, he looks ridiculous and out of place. But in the actual movie, he doesn't bother me at all. Little Godzilla spends most of this movie captive to the villain, Space Godzilla. Space Godzilla is a crystalline Godzilla clone from outer space with the sole motive of killing Godzilla and conquering planet Earth for itself. Space Godzilla's main attack is its corona beam that it fires from its mouth and shoulder crystals. It can also use a telekinetic attack called the Gravity Tornado, which he uses to throw Godzilla into a building. The Gravity Tornado would be Emperor Ghidorah's gravity beam idea repackaged. Defensively, it uses a photon reactive shield to deflect some of Godzilla's atomic breath attacks. It could also raise up these crystals that seem to give him more power, and he can launch them like missiles as well. Another advantage it has over Godzilla is that it has a flying form, which is how we first see it. It's theorized that Space Godzilla is created when Godzilla cells entered space through Biolanti's descent into the sky or that Mothra unknowingly carried the cells into space on her wings at the end of Godzilla vs. Mothra. These cells would then be irradiated by a black hole. This conquer the planet motive would normally be considered cliche, but for Godzilla movies, a monster having this evil intent is actually pretty rare. Normally we see monsters being controlled by aliens to do their bidding, or monsters are just a force of nature like Godzilla not good or evil in their intent. But Space Godzilla not only has a plan, but it even kidnaps Little Godzilla rather than just killing it. This shows a higher level of thinking than most monsters in Godzilla films so far. We've also never seen a monster in a Godzilla movie turn an entire city into its own fortress. The final battle of the film takes place here in the now crystallized Fukuoka. Now around this time, Daiei Film was producing a new Gamera movie, which would be called Gamera Guardian of the Universe. Rumors were that they would also be using the Japanese city of Fukuoka in their movie. So according to John LeMay, Toho and Daiei had to sit down and hash out which movie would get which locations in Fukuoka. My monster gets to destroy this, you get to destroy that. Wait a minute, I thought Daiei went bankrupt in 1971. Or whatever happened there. Whatever happened there? Daiei was making a comeback. They actually came back in 1974 and were able to produce some movies before eventually being bought out by a larger company. Space Godzilla was played by newcomer Yo Haria and was designed by Minoru Roshida who also designed Super Godzilla for the Super Nintendo game and would actually modify Super Godzilla's look for the final design for Space Godzilla. Space Godzilla's roar is made of recycled sounds, but instead of borrowing from Rodan like Ghidorah and Batra did, Toho took Gigan's roar and pitched it down. <laughs> It wouldn't be a Kawakita movie without some sort of mecha. Instead of Mechagodzilla, this time we get Mogura. Originally, Mogura was from the 1957 film The Mysterians. Back then, its name was derived from the Japanese word for mole. In this film, they turned the name into an acronym. The Mogura acronym stands for Mobile Operation Godzilla Universal Expert Robot Aerotype. Just rolls right off the tongue. Much to both its namesakes, it can burrow underground and fly. 
Additionally, it can shoot a plasma laser cannon and spiral grenade missiles. It also has the ability to split into two different machines, which is an idea that Kawakita wanted to use for Mechagodzilla. Mogoro's first battle is in outer space with Space Godzilla, and it's not great. Apparently this scene was filmed last and they had run out of budget, so everything had to be done in the crudest way possible. Small models of the monsters were built and were attached to strings from the Toho ceiling. You might be wondering, why the hell would Toho bring back Mogoro and not just use Mechagodzilla again? Toho's reasoning may have been that Godzilla and Mechagodzilla versus Space Godzilla would not be a fair fight. Also, you always have to consider the merchandise. A new mecha means a new toy to be sold. Despite this movie being the black sheep of the Heisei era, it does a lot to strengthen the continuity of the movies. Multiple aspects from previous films are mentioned and have a direct impact on the story. The writers of this movie finally have Megumi Odaka's character, Miki Saigusa, take center stage. We've watched this young girl now grow into a young woman, who no longer views Godzilla as evil, but as something that needs to be respected. Kashiwabara liked Mickey's character, and so he added a little more depth by having her involved in a romantic subplot with Koji Shinjo, played by Jun Hashizume. Kashiwabara would later say that Hashizume was a bad match as the actor, as he was way too serious. There's also a Yakuza side story thrown in so the humans have more action scenes, I guess. During the rescue mission, Mickey gains telekinetic powers to go along with her psychic abilities. She's basically Japanese carry at this point. The one character who stands out is Yuki, played by Akira Emoto. Yuki hates Godzilla and wants to avenge his fallen comrade, Mr. Badass himself, Goro Gondo, from Godzilla vs. Biollante. Gondo's sister appears in the film as well as an eventual love interest for Yuki. Some of Yuki's scenes, particularly the one where Godzilla comes ashore on Birth Island, are drawn out. I couldn't help but laugh every time he mentioned the Yuki special. Kashiwabara based the Yuki character on John Wayne, as he was a fan of westerns. The Birth Island scene itself was inspired by the John Wayne movie Hattori, and Kashiwabara originally envisioned Yuki capturing Godzilla with some sort of rocket net, but he quickly realized that just wouldn't work as a concept. Though they have different styles, Kashiwabara shares a similarity with Kazuki Omori, packing the story with a lot of subplots. In this case, a lot of different strategies on how to deal with Godzilla a year after Mechagodzilla's defeat are discussed. All of these ideas collide on Birth Island, Godzilla and Little Godzilla's de facto home. First is Project M, aka Mogura, which was originally built to fight Godzilla, not Space Godzilla. Then there's Project T, which involves the placement of a telepathic amplifier on the back of Godzilla's head that can be used by Mickey to control Godzilla. And of course, there's the Yuki special, which is just Yuki running around the island trying to shoot Godzilla with a rifle that contains his special handmade bullet. The bullet has a deadly blood coagulator that in theory would poison Godzilla and kill it. Of course, all these plans get interrupted when Space Godzilla arrives. I got confused when Kuji and Kyo both decide they want to help Yuki out, but unless their guns had the Yuki special in it, what the hell is a handgun going to do? I guess shooting Godzilla with a handgun would maybe make him turn around or something so Yuki can get a better shot. Akira Nakayo returns as Commander Aso, and maybe he goes unnoticed a bit, but you always need that firm-looking military man in these kind of movies, and he's very convincing. To be honest, this sort of goes for all the movies I've talked about so far, it's Kind of hard for me to judge the Japanese acting, considering I'm not fluent in Japanese and don't experience enough casual Japanese conversation to have context. But what I can say is that I enjoyed seeing these characters on screen and they kept my attention. In terms of spoken English, which I am fluent in, sort of, this movie is a big improvement. However, the script does not do them any favors. We can only speculate that it's some sort of huge monster. You know, I've been nothing but praiseworthy for Kawakita, but this might be the most embarrassing scene so far in this entire Heisei series. That just looks so cheap and shitty, and this is coming from a movie where a guy's wearing a rubber suit. And oddly enough, they cut out a lot of scenes that arguably shouldn't have been cut out because of runtime. Kawakita would say that they cut the extra scenes because they were too serious. Kawakita's ability to use mats once again shines, especially the impressive mats used for when Godzilla arrives at the beach. The scene is way too long, but visually it's stunning. Akira Ifakube's music is used for Godzilla and whenever the cosmos are on screen, but the movie's score is made by newcomer Takayuki Hattori. 
Yamashita said if Akube had scheduling conflicts, but other sources say if Akube disagreed with Yamashita on the approach to the music, so if Akube decided not to participate. I honestly don't have any complaints to the music, just give me that if Akube Godzilla theme and I'm usually happy. The final battle in this movie is quite long, but mostly entertaining. Godzilla and Mogura teaming up to fight this new foe was awesome to see. We get to see a full array of Space Godzilla's powers, and we get to see Godzilla's red atomic breath again. Kawakita experimented with a lot of different angles and compositions. Some would see this as a positive, but I actually got frustrated at times watching. Sometimes I just want a wide shot of the monsters fighting, not being interrupted by cutaways to human characters or close-ups where I don't know what the hell's going on. The healing power of love seems to be the theme at the heart of this movie. I think these dramatic elements are very important to make our movie stand out from the rest. At the end of the film, we see both Kuji and Yuki have left their hatred for Godzilla behind as they both have found themselves in love with their female counterparts. But as David Callet points out in his book, A Critical History of the Filmography of Toho's Godzilla series, Kyo, the jackass with the handgun before, is just a lonely fifth wheel who doesn't have love to heal his hatred for Godzilla, and so he can be seen still screaming at the monster at the end. On December 10th, 1994, Space Godzilla opened to Japanese audiences and its box office run would take in $20 million. As a kid, when I watched this movie for the first time, I was very disappointed. This time around, I didn't hate it. In fact, I liked it. I have a lot of complaints, like using stock footage and Godzilla's suit falling apart in a few scenes, but I liked the characters and I was happy to see Megumi Otika finally get to be front and center. As I make these videos, I'm re-watching these movies for the first time in a really long time. So personally, it's interesting to see what my adult self enjoys compared to how I felt as a kid. Though this movie gets mixed reviews, Space Godzilla would become very popular in the US. Not the movie, the character. What I mean by that is, whenever a Godzilla video game or toy line was launched, Space Godzilla was prominently shown, despite only being in one movie. In later years, and in a weird coincidence, the name of one of Space Godzilla's abilities would cause a minor hubbub. The people who make Magic the Gathering decided to create a Space Godzilla card. Unfortunately, they decided to call it Death Corona. So that caused a little bit of a controversy because of the pandemic that was going on starting in 2020. By the time Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla was out of theaters, it became apparent that the American Godzilla project still wasn't all ready yet. So once again, Toho had to make one more Godzilla film. One more, that's it for real this time, and they could hand off Godzilla to the Americans and ride off into the sunset. Tomiyama was going to make sure of it too, and more importantly, so did the man who started it all. Tomiyuki Tanaka finally decided it was time for Godzilla to die. So next time, we close out the Heisei era of Godzilla with 1995's Godzilla vs. Destoroyah.